tell you my story and you will definitely agree on me. I'm sure about that. But of course, there are other perspective, uh, perspectives and I'm pretty sure that no one ever, ever did anything to do me any harm. Everybody did everything because they wanted to help me. They had the best intentions but the best intentions don't always have the best outcomes. That's maybe what I'm going to tell you today. But let's start with the beginning. It actually all started in uh, 2012, after I gave birth to my third son. Yes, three sons. We should have known, shouldn't we? I mean, three sons, the reactions. Oh my God, three sons, so much energy, so much testosterone, they're right, by the way. Three sons, I mean, there was one colleague of my husband who said, three sons, that must drive you mad. But, well, yeah, <laughs> apparently it did, because after three months, I had a postpartum psychosis. And that was actually pretty new to me and to my husband as well. We, we didn't have any experience with psychiatric disorders or psychiatric problems in the past. So it wasn't that easy to recognize. But I will tell you the ingredients, you know them all. I had this really nice ex psychosis from the textbooks. Yeah. So it started, of course, with a nice conspiracy theory. Yeah. So I thought that it started with some miscalculations in the wages of my colleagues and then somehow it ended up with the idea that I had discovered the biggest fraud case in Belgian educational history. Nice conspiracy, check, ingredient number one. And then of course there was lack of sleep, but what do you think? I had two toddlers and a baby, so I didn't have a lot of sleep, that sort of added it up. And of course there was the fear, and there was also the uh, paranoia, and there was a lot of distrust. I didn't trust anyone, because I somehow, I told my colleagues, and they weren't really shocked, they weren't really surprised, and I was like, you're not surprised, are you? That's because you're in the conspiracy. Yeah, and then of course I went to a lawyer and I told my story and she was actually the best lawyer they had in this lawyer's office. I don't know what you think that a, a best lawyer should look like. I, I, should, I thought it would be a man with grey hair, like Matlock for people who know Matlock. She was blonde, 25 years old, I really. And then she said, I can't help you. So what do you think I think? She's inside the conspiracy. I thought, she's in this compound. And then I thought, I'll just phone the police, which is what I did. And everybody knows there always has to be somebody attending the phone, right? They have to pick up the phone. They're this sort of organization where people have to be. So I phoned them, but you know, of course, that coincidence does not exist in a psychosis. And they did not pick up the phone. That's not really a coincidence, is it? So this, this, there's this big conspiracy theory where my colleagues are involved, where my, my well, the lawyer is involved and the police is involved. So I, I'm getting like very much afraid and nobody was actually listening to me besides one man. He was called Jan and he's actually my husband. So and I told him everything and it was really, because it was based there were some miscalculations. There was a basis of truth somewhere. And he listened to me, but there was, though, a tipping point. And that was when I told him, Yum, we have to flee the country right away because I know too much. <laughs> and people are getting after me, and we have to get the children out of here, and we have to go straight to Brussels International Airport. And then he said, okay, Brussels International Airport, all the doctors. <laughs> and of course, ingredient number five is lack of insight. That's what they call it. I do not realize that I have a psychosis, so why should I go to a doctor? But I have this very nice husband, and he somehow convinced me. That wasn't an easy job. There's even a whole book about it, <laughs> how he tried to convince me to get help. But we went to the GP, and it actually wasn't my personal GP, because he was on a holiday. So we arrived at this GP, and he said, okay, how can I help you? I said, you can, because I'm not sick. And he said, okay, then I can't treat you. I'm like, okay, so have you been studying for seven years and you can't help me? Are you a fraud or something? Are you, are you really a doctor? Now the problem was that the doctor didn't 
recognize the psychosis and was so much confronted by what I said, by my verbal aggression, mm -hmm, that he, watch out, phoned the police, who were suddenly attending. They were there now. Right. Okay, so he phoned the police, police came. I was brought to the ER or the AE or whatever it's called in your language. Uh, so I was brought there and that's where the madness of the caretaker starts. Because actually, do you remember who, who I trusted? My husband. There was one person I trusted. So when we arrived there, the first thing they did was they took me to a separate room and then there was another room where I was brought. So I was away from young, I was away from my children, and there were all these caretakers asking me questions, wanting me to trust them. I didn't know them. I, they, I, I just trusted my husband. And then suddenly there was this nurse coming up to me. She said, you're way too agitated. We need to calm you down. We're going to sedate you. And I was like, yeah, I have to confess, I'm actually a member of the breastfeeding mob. Yeah? So that means that I want to breastfeed or nurse my children for over a year or even more. So when the nurse came with the syringe, I did what every mother would have done. Because I heard my baby crying in the other room because he was hungry. And I wanted to breastfeed him. And the breasts too. <laughs> I could feel that. So when the syringe came, I fought, I spit, I kicked, I did everything I could to prevent me from being sedated. But of course they see this as part of the psychosis. The aggression is a symptom of the psychosis. So in the meantime my husband was waiting there, didn't get any answers. Zen was given a first bottle of milk, cold, because nobody helped him out. And he brought the children home because he had to get some clothes for me. And when he returned, he said, um, I brought some clothes for my wife. And he said, she's not here anymore. We brought her to the psychiatric ward. And that was her first acquaintance with the psychiatric ward. Upon arrival, the patient is extremely manic, uninhibited, aggressive, and paranoid psychotic. She sees Jesus and thinks that the true is abusing her children. She violently resists her admission in every possible way, bites, scratches, spits. Her thinking is extremely associative. The woman is so agitated that she must be cared for in seclusion. I fought like an animal that was cornered, like a lioness, like a beast, and that's how they treated me. I spent three days in seclusion room, being restrained from Friday night till uh, Sunday afternoon, and then finally on Monday, they brought me to the locked ward. And these three days, I only saw my husband for five minutes, no more, because they told my family and my husband that I needed to rest. And I was so angry with my husband, because he had promised me for better and for worse, and it wasn't getting any worse than this, was it? And he wasn't there. So finally, they took me to the locked ward, and I didn't know where my children were, but I did get slips of paper and a pencil to write. And all this conspiracy theory about fraud cases was all gone. Wow, this seclusion room really works. But it somehow turned me into a mad mother. Because without my children, the madness ag aggravated. And so I wrote down, where are my children? Where are my children? I slipped them under the door. And after a while, I ran out of slips of paper. And there was just a pencil and a really big white wall. <laughs> and so I started to write on the walls. I want to see my children. I want to see my children. And the nurse entered and she said, bad girl, you shouldn't be writing on the walls. And I thought, you're not actually reading what I just wrote there, but I didn't tell her that. And they phoned my husband and he said, your wife's not doing very well. She isn't. No, she's writing on the walls. No, she doesn't do that at home. <laughs> and then finally, after a week, I only saw my children once. And when they came, what would you do? What would you do? I saw them and I grabbed them. I was like, don't take them away from me. And the report said, better not visit with the children anymore because patient cannot handle it. So I didn't see them anymore. 
and I was brought to, after a week, some nurse, smart nurse, said, yes, but this woman, she just gave birth, right? Isn't she just like this very good patient for our baby mother unit? They had one there. Oh, yeah, that might be a good idea. So they brought me to the baby mother unit or muddy baby unit, but of course I had lost all confidence in this institution. So when Jan came, I said, okay, you can file, I'm going to file for a divorce or you're getting me out of here. And I said, okay, we'll talk to the doctors and that's what we did. And I said, I'm going home. And she said, you can because you're here voluntarily. <gasps> I'm here voluntarily. Oh, oh yes, of course, this is totally my thing, being tied up. Okay, I really like that. <laughs> so I just went. And that, of course, wasn't such a good idea, was it? But I just went home with this bag of medication and everything. And in the report, it said lack, lack of insight. But I went home and I googled straight away psychosis and what should we do? Devastating news, of course. I had a brain disease and not, it was not getting any better. And so I started phoning hospitals. Hello, I seem to have a psychosis. What are we going to do about this? And they said, yeah, we've got this therapy program. And then they said, yeah, um, we have from a 9 to 11 volleyball. I was like, I, I thought I had a severe disease. What am I going to play volleyball? So I had, during the period I was at home, I had a lot of arguments with my husband. He's in, here's an excerpt from my husband's diary. We had an argument every evening about how to educate the children, about our next plan, about which therapies were suitable, which legal steps we had to absolutely take today. I learned to pick my battles early on. A conflict about every single thing would not solve anything. I decided to focus on the things that I thought were critical, caring for the children, the medication. The latter especially gave rise to endless discussions. You cannot just stop taking your medication like that, Brenda. Just like a car mechanic knows how to repair an engine, a psychiatrist knows how you need to phase out medication. Every evening I hoped that she would finally take her medication. Every morning I hoped she would get into the car and go to therapy. We had many rows. We had many fights because he didn't actually listen to me. Because it's not that I didn't want to take the medication, but the medication took away my breastfeeding. I couldn't handle that. The, I, I never said goodbye to that period of breastfeeding and this union I had with my son. And breastfeeding was important for me as a mother. Why? Because I was a boy's mom. And as a boy's mom, I was looking for my role because my sons really look up to their father. And where was I in this picture? And the breastfeeding made me unique. It made me special. It was something that my husband couldn't do. And they took that away from me. So that's why I had been fighting for it. And that's why I wanted to stop the medication. And no, I didn't want to go to therapy because the children were at home. And I didn't want to play volleyball when the children were at home. So it was so difficult. Nobody actually listened to me. So of course, after six weeks, I decided I wanted to stop the medication. And of course, we're doing this cold turkey right <laughs> because we don't have a lot of patients there. So I went to the psychiatrist and I said, I'm quitting my medication. And she said, <laughs> I haven't heard anything, but keep me posted. I'm like, how can you not hear anything? <laughs> so I thought, it's such a strange reaction, I'll just quit the medication. So that's what I did. And of course my family was, no, don't stop the medication. Because one advice, don't stop cold turkey. I mean, let it sort of phase out. And I'm off medication since four years already. But if you just quit like cold turkey, it will get you into trouble. <laughs> and it did, because after three weeks, I was acute psychotic. There were some new ingredients there. Yeah. Now we had the spiritual wave coming up. Yeah, I could read thoughts. And of course, I was the incarnation of my deceased aunt. <laughs> and I had to sort of step into her feet and the uh, footsteps. And um, that was this time. I'll just spare you the details. There's really a nice book about it, marketing number two, uh, which is called uh, Soul During uh, <laughs> the Break. But I'll spare you the details. Um, I thought it was my aunt, and she apparently, in my head, had to steal a car. Fortunately, it was my car. <laughs> Strange story. Okay. But I was taken to the police office, husband, police. 
They convinced me to go to the psychiatric hospital, which I did, voluntarily, yeah. And I was very at ease, because as soon as I entered the psychiatric hospital, there was this statue of Mother Mary and Jesus, like baby child Jesus. And that's the first thing I saw. And everything in a psychosis has a meaning. So I saw this and I'm like, okay, motherhood is important here. It's okay here, it's good to be here. So, but of course it was Tuesday night and there was not a lot of staff. So better safe than sorry, right? So they brought me to the seclusion room anyway. But that was okay because I was just thinking about motherhood and Mother Mary and chaos theory, theory and whatever. So I was locked in the seclusion room and somewhere in the middle of the night, I had to pee and I went to the toilet and I saw there was no toilet seat. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in a seclusion room. <laughs> I had this sort of reality check. And so this happened in the report. Wednesday, 5th of September 2012, 2.50. Suddenly started to scream out of nowhere, wants to leave, very agitated, verbally aggressive, threatening. After talking to the doctor on call, give an injection of propisol, acritard, and tromxine 50 milligrams and keep her here. Refused the injection, impossible to talk to, took over with six nurses, forced five point restraint and gave her the injection. So there I was again, and they uh, injected afterwards Abilify. I was injected the Abilify and I had to stay there in the seclusion room for a week. There's not really much to do in a seclusion room, but think. You can only think. There's no diversion, there's nothing else to do than think. So I don't really think that helps. But after 10 days, I had to appear in front of a judge and he said, oh, you've been doing very well, Brenda, you can go. Okay, so I went. <laughs> I went home with other medication because I had so many side effects with the Abilify. And that was probably the tipping point for my relationship with my husband because I had, with Abilify, I was trembling. I couldn't sit anymore because I was so agitated. I always wanted to go outside and run, but that's very difficult in a locked ward. So you're actually like running around the table and they're like, ooh, what, the, what a loony it is. And I thought, okay, just let me out, but nah. Okay, so I had all these side effects and it was on time that my husband visited me and I was on the ground and I was like shivering and almost drawling. And he came and he said, doctor, this is not my wife anymore. And then the doctor said, yeah, but she will be, because she has to be medicated. And then Jan said, then I'm getting her out of here. So I went home, and maybe it's because I changed medication, maybe it's because I returned to the same context, maybe it's because they didn't look for the cause, what was actually, what was my psychosis telling me. And so I went home, and there, within a week, acute psychotic. <laughs> three times in a row. <laughs> I had a half an hour to talk about this, right? So uh, again, uh, I had a psychosis and my husband said, okay, we phoned a psychiatrist who we couldn't reach. And he said, I need more support from the family for my sister. Um, and so we went to where they live and there I became very psychotic. I heard voices of young girls being raped and uh, I heard burglars and I thought I had a miscarriage. This is something that actually returns every time in every psychosis. Nobody ever asked about that, but I had four miscarriages, so that might explain something. So they took me to the police station, uh, uh, to the ER, and there the police came and said, uh, Miss, we think it's better that you uh, are going voluntarily to uh, a psychiatric ward, which I didn't want to. And then there was this uh, juridical doctor who came and said I had to. So I was brought to a psychiatric ward, another one, with police guidance and handcuffed because they were afraid of me. And the fear of the policeman, the fear of the caretaker is always more important than the fear of the patient. So when I arrived at the hospital handcuffed, that's not really a good impression, is it? So I, I arrived there and they just brought me to the seclusion room where I spent two days and then afterwards I had to appear in front of a judge who said, 40 days, you have to stay here. And I did. I stayed 40 days and I was a very critical patient. You wouldn't have liked me. I was like, okay, therapy, 10 minutes late. We should start, right? And we had like, we had to bake pancakes. And I was like, can you show me some evidence-based 
like research that these pancakes are going to help me with the psychosis. Like, eh. They didn't like that. And then they said, Brenda, we still think you're manic. And I said, you don't know me, do you? Because I actually am a stranger to you. And they said, yeah, yeah, we do think you're manic. Uh, and that's why we decided you can't go home this weekend. And that's when I decided I had to do what I was told. And I, retur I turned into a stranger to myself because I had always thought that my energy, my critical way of thinking, my outgoingness was my strength. And now they said I had been hypomanic all my life. I turned home and, uh, after 40 days and the children were estranged from me. They said, oh no, daddy can do this better. We're used to him now. And the baby was attached to young. He was his person, and I wasn't there. When I took him, he started crying. And then I thought, if I can't be a mother, if I don't know who I am anymore, I don't want to be here anymore. And so I became very suicidal, and I had to look for myself. But there is, though, a happy ending. I went to look for solutions. I found a good psychiatrist, a psychoanalytical, sorry for the CBT guys, uh, who actually helped me. <laughs> and I found a good psychologist, but it's not because of them that I'm here, actually. And gradually it became better. Um, I'm not going to read it out because I'm running out of time. But, yeah, gradually she'd say something less negative now and then. She'd have a moment that was not dominated by darkness and doom or long periods of silence. Her eyes were still dull, her voice still weak, but you could tell she was getting stronger. Things did not get worse. The darkest discussions happened less often. Now and then I realized that she was still angry about the situation, which came as a relief after the despondent self-chastisement. She closed up less often, found it easier to get out of bed, talked a little more, and now and then she'd smile, a beautiful smile. So I'm here again, now, and I think I found myself, although that was really difficult. We talk about people having to look for their identity. Actually, I think I know who I am, but people somehow seem to judge me all the time. I have to prove myself every time and time and again. When I come on a conference like this, I think twice or even more what I'm going to wear, how, how, will, how, which impression am I going to make, because I've got this stigma. There is a self-stigma, but there is a self-stigma because there is a stigma. And I always have to prove myself so much more than anyone else. But there is one person I can be myself with, and that's my husband. And so we were once strangers, but now I know myself again, and I'm very proud to present you to Brenda Freud. She is uh, actually she's a teacher educator, like she has always been before her psychosis, but she's also a writer. That's what the psychosis did. I started writing books. I always wanted to write books. I didn't know what about, and then I got this psychosis gift. <laughs> and it turned into many books. I've got like four now, and my children's book is actually coming up next week that explains children what psychological problems are. So I think that's my most important book because it, because it combines my talents and my experience into one. So that's Brenda, who's all this but above all, she is and will always be the wife of Young, and she will always be the mother of my three sons. And so I would like to present you to my sons. The little one is Zen, Long, Yip, and the one on the motorbike <laughs> is Young. <laughs> and they actually, if I'm going to tell you a story, this is my story. It's the story of four knights who conquered the dragon and saved princess. Thank you. Wow.